from Microbe TV. This is Twin, This Week in Neuroscience, episode number 15, recorded on February 16th, 2021. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about neuroscience. Joining me today from New York, Ori Lieberman. Hi, Vincent. How are you doing? Are you in New York? I'm never sure. Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all good here. From Salt Lake City, Jason Shepard. Welcome. Hi, Vincent. How are you doing? I'm um, busy, but good. No, Funny, got good. some snow over here. And from New York, Andres Bendeski. Hello. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Nice to be back. I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, good to see you. I know. Sorry. <laughs> the pandemic and the kids. And yeah, you can blame the kids, sure. We have or, a guest today from Los Angeles, California, UCLA, Helen Vuong. Welcome to Twin. Hi, nice to meet everyone. How's it in LA? Is it nice and warm? Um, I would turn the camera around, but I'm afraid to move it. But it's uh, <laughs> it's actually quite sunny outside. Very nice. Are you originally from California? Yes. Uh, born and raised in San Diego. Cool. And uh, moved to L.A. for school or university. So you went to college at UCLA also? Yes, I did my undergrad, my Ph.D., and um uh, my postdoc now at UCLA. Uh, wow. I wasn't, I wasn't planning on that. I wasn't planning <laughs> on it, but I was, I was following the science. So I ended up uh, also at UCLA for my postdoc. I guess. At that time, Elaine, my mentor, was at um, Caltech. And so I was, I was following her science. And I, I as I finished my, uh, my PhD, I said, oh, I'm going to Caltech. Not too far, but you know, still within the LA area. And, um, cool. by my second interview, she was like, Oh, Helen, um, by the way, I'm coming to UCLA. <laughs> so here I am. I know Lane from CZI. This is, we both have this Van Barris award from uh, CZI. So. Mm -hmm. And, and yes. Ori, you don't know Helen before, do you? No, but I know Elaine through one of my good friends from undergrad who got his PhD in the lab um, where Elaine was doing a postdoc. Okay. Um, and yeah. So. All right. And I hosted, I was a student host for Elaine when she came to visit Columbia a couple of years ago now. Okay. Well, anyway, Helen, Helen thank you for doing this. We, we appreciate it. Um, and we would like to You're talk. You're welcome. I'm happy to talk about I'm happy to talk about my research. Yeah, we you have this lovely paper, uh, the maternal microbiome modulates fetal neurodevelopment in mice. Why don't you tell us uh, all about that? It's like, what, what what led up to this first? Yeah, sure. Um, so we were initially curious about what would be important for development. And um, a lot of the studies that have come out in about the microbiome have really focused on early life microbiome or the adult microbiome. And some of those really foundational studies have all sort of looked at um, presence or absence of a microbiota, particularly um, looking at control conventionally colonized animals or germ-free animals, so animals that were raised in these sterile bubble isolators. And um, they've looked at um, some brain changes and behavioral changes in those animals, but typically it was in um, postnatal adult animals. And so um, this led us to some interesting findings about um, what could potentially be important about early life microbiome before birth, so during for the maternal microbiome. Um, and some of this work was um, sort of inspired by other researchers that have looked at the maternal microbiome as sort of a mediator of different types of um, maternal insults like high fat diet or maternal immune activation where um, 
some of the maternal microbiome was important for carrying out the effects of these challenges. And so we were really curious about uh, in the absence of any challenges, was the maternal microbiome important? Can it be um, something that's naturally setting the state for how the um, offspring develops? Um, and so, uh, of course, we're really interested in, in fetal brain development. And so this led us to um, kind of ask the question, what is the role of the homeostatic maternal microbiome uh, for brain development? Um, and that sort of inspired us to do this entire project. Um, and uh, this, this, the first um, question we had was, what was the maternal microbiome doing for the fetal brain? And we decided to ask, answer this question by using um, RNA sequencing of the fetal brain. Um, and so we profiled the transcriptome of fetal brains from moms that uh, uh, the fetal brains from moms that um, were from a full microbiome versus um, a germ free. So absence of any microbiome or from moms that were treated with broad spectrum antibiotics to deplete their microbiome. And before um, you and so, sort of get going, I yeah. have a big picture question here. Um, so based on those previous studies that showed um, that the, the maternal microbiome can, could influence some of these disease states in the fetal brain, what was the, what was the mechanism? What, so you've got you know, bugs in the gut of the mom and why would that change, um, you know, development in, in the fetus? Is that through some metabolic change or is, you know, what, what's the signaling going on? Yeah, there's, so from the, um, from the maternal immune activation side, um, that is, uh, thought to be mediated by um, both placental changes in um, IL-6 and also um, brain changes in um, IL-17 levels. Um, so some of this work was done by Elaine early in her graduate work with Paul Patterson, where they looked at maternal immune activation and profiled the placenta and so these, saw that these there were changes are... in IL-6. For, for the general audience, these are cytokines. These are um, little uh, signaling proteins that are released by the immune system, right? Yes, correct. Um, and so this is thought to be from the maternal side. So for IL-6, for example, and IL-17, these were elevated levels of those um, immune signaling molecules in a mom um, and that those molecules have a downstream effect of changing um, fetal brain and ultimately um, the offspring sort of behavior, um, particularly work from um, Dan Littman, June and Gloria Choi's group where they looked at maternal immune activation. They found these sort of really unique things called cortical patches, so sort of missing cells within the, a, a specific region of the brain. Hmm. Um, and that corresponded with um, uh, changes in brain activity that led to these um, autism-like behaviors, like repetitive behaviors, antisocial behaviors. Right. Um, and so that was, that's one mechanism. And so, so it, coming back to why they think it's microbiome mediated is because they looked at different moms that are my, uh, maternal microbiomes from different um, uh, vendor sources. So they looked at Jackson uh, laboratory versus Taconic laboratory um, mice. And um, the JAX labs don't have a particular bacterium, this SFB bacterium, and then this taconic one does. And when 
they do the maternal immune activation in the animals that have the SFB bacterium, they were then saw the all the brain changes in the fetus. But if they did not have, if the mom didn't have this SFB bacterium, they didn't see the same uh, brain and behavioral changes in the offspring. So this sort of suggests yeah. that there's a, a micro maternal microbiome mediated effect. But, but ultimately, that's through the immune system. And so then in your studies that you're getting to now, did you guys have a, you know, obviously you you're sort of first wanted to see if there's any phenotypes, but did you have a rationale yeah. to how you think the microbiome could influence normal development? Yeah, we were, we were interested in sort of the microbiome microbiome mediated products. So, so what, however, the, whatever kind of products were being generated directly by the microbes or influenced by host, um, uh, processes, we were interested in what those little molecules could be doing and how they could ultimately, um, not, not only be regulated in the maternal microbiome, but through maternal blood all the way to the fetal brain, cool. um, and then ultimately affecting brain development and behavior. Yeah. Cause I, so I would say that, that there was kind of a, there's a bit of a, not a controversy, but sort of un, it's unclear with a lot of these developmental effects, whether the actual products of the bacteria are important directly act, you know, directly influencing brain function, or do they act through an intermediate, like the immune system or something other, something else that's not um, actually in the brain, right? Right, right, exactly. One of the classic uh, molecules produced by bacteria in the gut is vitamin K, right? Aren't there, aren't there many others that are known to be uh, metabolites needed for like mammalian function that are made by bacteria besides that one and the ones that you now found in your paper? Yeah, like short chain fatty acids were are sort of these common um, metabolites that have been identified to be direct products of microbes, mm -hmm. uh, particularly bacteria uh, fermentation. And so um, we actually tested short chain fatty acids to see whether or not they would have the same effect um, uh, as the key metabolites that we identified. Um, and so we didn't see the same uh, robust effect um, when we gave these um, short chain fatty acids back to the mom and the drinking water. Um, and so uh, perhaps short chain fatty acids are important for brain development and likely they are, but in the, in the phenotype that we were looking for, which was axonogenesis or axon formation differences, short chain fatty acids, at least for the, the lamocortical axons, didn't have the same uh, direct effects as the key metabolites that we identified. But they, you know, short chain fatty acids can work on microglia um, and it can work on other cells that express GP43 or, um, or GP41 G protein coupled receptors. And those are pretty broad express. So um, short chain fatty acids likely have a, a, a big role. So tell us, tell us what you did in the kind of to start off. How did you think about developing the phenotype um, with your differently treated mice? Oh, right. Okay. So um, we first, uh, so like I said, we did a transcriptomic analysis of these um, fetal brains. Um, we found a lot of different changes. We found over 300 different differentially expressed genes um, in the fetal brain from moms that uh, were depleted of their microbiome versus conventionally colonized ones. Um, and so many of these genes were important for um, neurogenesis, um, synapse formation, um, and even axon, axonogenesis. And one key one that stood out to us that was really um, highly differentially regulated was Netrin G1A. Um, and so we found that this one was really cool because it was localized to um, the thalamus and it's localized to the axons and they're, and they don't, it doesn't necessarily act like a classical Netrin uh, guidance factor. It requires a, an intimate interaction with a, its particular ligand receptor. 
Um, and so when we looked at the Netrin GYA expression in the fetal brain, um, normally what we would see is this robust labeling in the thalamus and their axons. Um, and we would see the projections of these Netrin GYA positive thalamocortical axons all the way up reaching towards the cortex. Um, but what was interesting was when we looked at antibiotic treated um, uh, brains from the ABX group, which are the antibiotic treated ones and the germ free group, we saw way less of these axons, um, particularly those that were coming from the thalamus and projecting to the cortex. Um, and so we were really curious. We were unclear of exactly how, what was going on. Is it the fact that these thalamic axons couldn't be formed, uh, couldn't grow, or was this something that was because the guidance factors that they normally receive was not, you know, wasn't properly being produced, so they weren't reading these signals. And so um, we did uh, an ex vivo axon outgrowth assay. Oh, yes. So, so you... You compare the brains of the mice treated with antibiotics and without that, like 14 days into into development. Is it possible that the ones with antibiotics are like delayed? So if you test them one day later, now they cut up and they have the same. They don't have a defect in netrin or axons, or does that persist throughout development, or they just are late and they catch up? Yeah, that's such an interesting question. So, we, so a really a, a big part of this project was to isolate a specific time window of when the maternal microbiome is important, what or the microbiome in general. When is the microbiome important for brain development? Uh, is it the maternal microbiome? Is it early maternal microbiome? Is it late? Um, is it postnatal? early life microbiome, when is the microbiome really important for brain development? Um, and so one way that we sort of, we thought of isolating this question was to take and perturb the maternal microbiome at a specific window, which was then from E0 to E14.5, um, and then collected samples at E14.5, looked at the brain. Um, we will later on in the project is try to see whether the, the particular effects that we see from depleting the maternal microbiome from E0 to E14.5 continues on later in life. And to tackle that question is after E14.5, we decolonize these animals and look to see if we see the same uh, behavioral effects uh, as uh, from an animal that has a full microbiome that wasn't depleted from E0.5. Uh, E0 to E14.5. Um, and so, if I just could backtrack a little more, is that when from E0 to E14.5, there's the development of many different processes. In particular, the lamocortical axons are really developing at this point. And they continue actually to develop postnatally too. Um, and so, we wanted to follow this all the way from P8 to, you know, all the way to adult. When we looked, and we don't have this um, data in the paper, but when we looked at the P8 brains of the three different groups, so control animals, depleted animals, or deficient animals, so the germ-free, we saw that there were still axons present. So like you said, there's still um, development of these axons after E14.5. And so it's not like once at E14.5, they stopped altogether and there's no more of these thalamocortical axons, right? They, they still continue to develop, but we think there's probably sort of a delay. Um, and what we know about development of these axons is timing is really important because they're receiving at each of these time points, they're receiving these cues to tell them to go in this direction, avoid this direction at this time, and project towards the cortex. And particularly these thalamocortical axons is by P8, they reach the cortex and they form these synapses with cortical neurons that are strengthened by experience and activity dependence. Um, and so because of this sort of 
delay for a, after this E0, E14.5 depletion of the maternal microbiome, it suggests that there's probably some key development that's happening right there. And so when we looked at P8 brains, we saw that they still had the axons there, but they weren't as um, well per, um, formed. So they're not as precise. So if we were looking at the barrels, so each of these axons kind of reach out and form these barreloids in the somatosensory cortex, and instead of having these really concise barreloids, they're sort of more sparse and distributed. Um, and so that was really interesting. And we we still have to follow up more on that to, to, to get a clear understanding of whether or not there's an actual disruption um, sort of in this midway point. Um, so was, was, it, was it a little surprising how specific this um, defect is? That, I mean... You know, it sort of seems like a very bizarre system to have these direct metabolites from bacteria influence a specific set of axons in the brain. Like, why would you want that? <laughs> it seems like it's an easy way to have issues when, you know, you don't have the right diet. And, and clearly, our diets have, have, you know, changed a lot as well. So it's sort of, uh, I don't know, at least to me, I, I thought it was surprising. I'm not sure if you guys thought it was surprising. <laughs> I don't know if anyone has an opinion to that, but I also found it was pretty, it was really intriguing to us. I, I would have to point out that this is not a, um, it's not a physiological um, sort of paradigm because we're, we're looking at a, a full microbiome versus a complete depletion, right? Like sure. no more bugs in the mom. Like what does that, what does that do to development? And that's, it's way more drastic than if you were to just change your diet, for example. Um, so it, it, that's why I think there's such a more, uh, such a more pronounced phenotype that we see. Right. I mean, yeah, exactly. That's a good point. I mean, clearly these bacteria have co-evolved with, with us. And I don't know, you know, how long ago these specific metabolites became important, but, um, but it does seem a sort of interesting way of, you know, regulating a specific set of, of connections in the brain. But these are direct, I mean, I've, I, I'm still sort of, blo I, when I read the paper, I was blown away by the fact that these, these are the direct metabolites of bugs in the, in the gut that are affecting, you know, these complex uh, connectivity patterns in the brain. Yeah, these, some of these metabolites are um, host modulated. So they're not the direct products of the microbes themselves. Um, so they're, they've been in some ways, um, uh, modified by the, the host um, cells like the liver to regulate um, TMAO, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I found it really curious. We, we did not look at other um, developmental processes. So we really focused in on highlighting axons, axonogenesis, and what its effects could be. Whether there's a broader impact, which is likely the case for these particular metabolites, um, uh, we did not explore yet, which is a really great future direction that um, we're hoping to kind of um, go deeper into and, and understand is what else are these metabolites doing? How are they um, how are they carrying out their actions? Like what are the respective receptors or are they just, um, diffusing into the cell to regulate, you know, gene expression, how the exact mechanism of what these metabolites are, um, uh, how they carry out their role is still very, very unclear. So, um, but can I ask a quick question? So how specific is the defense? Like if you, if you look at brain weight or if you look at, um, I guess like you can look at other particular systems, but like, let's just say brain weight, for example, um, do you see an overall decrease in, um, in like mass in the, within the brain or is it really specific to this circuit? Yeah, we didn't look at, um, after applying, um, uh, the, um, the microbial metabolites, we didn't look at overall brain, um, weight. We measured the overall size of the, um, 
like the area of the sections that we were we were quantifying. So what we do know is that in the ABX brains compared to the control SPF brains, they're a little bit smaller. Germ-free brains don't have, seem to have that much of a difference. The um, overall areas don't seem seem to be significantly different in, in um, between the groups. So it doesn't seem like they're changing brain size. Okay. By, in, in, in terms of gross morphological changes. Um, but yeah, it could be something more distinct like cortical thickness or something like that. Sure. And then, so tell us how you got at the mechanism for how the axon growth is is changing. Um, I, I really liked the explant system, and I thought it was like really elegant that you could take or kind of a recipient brain region from one condition and a um, thalamic explant from another condition. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that system. Yeah, totally. Um, so we, uh, like I mentioned, we weren't really clear about why or how these um, the like neurons from the ABX and germ-free group were being perturbed. Like, why are there so so much less of them? Was it because they intrinsically couldn't grow out any of these axons, or was it a, a, a Q-mediated effect? So typically in these developing axons, they receive cues from the hypothalamus and the striatum. So the striatum usually releases these attracting cues to tell the, these axons to go this way. And then the repel, uh, the hypothalamus releases these repellent cues to, um, you know, tell these axons to turn away from this particular direction. So taking I, I this system... Sorry, one yes. thing in your in your genes that were differentially expressed, uh, one of those was slit one, right? Uh, another axon yes. guidance gene. Yes. Did that yes. have a role in the end? Um, it ultimately did wasn't significantly. Uh, when we added in slit one, we didn't see any specific effects of slit one um, being regulating these axons and the growth of these axons. Yeah. But um, I actually don't remember the directionality of which way, which it was a slit one was up or down regulated in this case. I think maybe it was down regulated, but I'll have to double check on that. Um, okay, that's fine. Uh, yeah, so we, so utilizing the ex vivo axon outgrowth phase, we took these embryo brains and we isolated the thalamus and the lamic explant, co cultured it next to a striatal explant, hypothalamic explant. And from this, we counted the number of axons and the length of these axons to um, from the proximal side of, of the thalamus proximal to the striatum or um, the thalamus that's proximal to the hypothalamus side. Um, and so when we saw this, we, we sort of recapitulated the, uh, what we saw in, in embryonic brain sections, where we, in the ABX and germ-free groups, they had way less axons formed compared to the control SPF group. And so um, what we noticed from this was that it didn't seem like these axons couldn't produce, or these thalamus couldn't produce axons. It was just that there were way less of them. So Potentially, this had something to do with these guidance factors. Um, and so what we did was we co-cultured um, with cross-condition explants. Um, so just like Ori had just mentioned, we took a thalamus from um, an SPF embryo and we co-cultured it next to um, a striatal and hypothalamic explants from an ABX embryo brain. And when we did this, we saw that there were still a significant number of axons growing. So um, it seems like the, the striatum and the hypothalamus are still acting in their normal ways of producing ax, um, these cues necessary for the thalamus to grow out axons in, a, in their re respective directions. Now, when we took an ABX thalamus and co-cultured it with an SPF striatum and an SPF um, uh, hypothalamus, we still saw the deficiency. So we still saw a lack of axons growing in these ABX thalamic neurons or explants. 
Um, and so this led us to hypothesize two things. So one way that this could be happening is that the um, ABX thalamus is, um, res is erroneously responding to these um, guidance cues coming from the striatum. So normally they should be um, growing out these axons directly towards the striatum. But in the case of these ABX thalamus and in these germ-free thalamus, we saw that there were still less of these axons. So maybe the thalamus itself was not responding correctly to these attracting cues. Alternatively, it could be hyper-responsive to these repulsive cues. So instead of um, responding normally to the um, repulsive cues that they're getting, they're just being hyperactive or hyper responsive to these negative uh, or repellent cues. So those are two mechanisms that we think is in play for um, why these um, ABX and germ-free thalamic explants are not growing as well. Um, and so we sort of use the same assay to uh, address um, the effects of these microbial metabolites. So before I go into that part, I guess we can we can talk about um, uh, the th the fourth group in this um, experimental paradigm, which are these spore formers that we colonize these moms with. So we uh, colonize these moms with a consortium of spore formers. Um, and they are part of the, one of the dominant phyla in the microbiome, which are the firmicutes or firmicute, firmicutes. Um, and so it's firmicutes versus like bacteroides. And we colonize the moms with two groups, these two dominant phylas. And um, we saw sort of a intermediate effect of the bacteroides group. Like it was partially if sufficient of growing out these thalamic axons, but the spore formers were the most efficient. Um, and the reason why we were asked, we were looking at these two groups is because we were wondering, is it, is the particular types of microbes important or is it just any microbes important for growing out these axons? And so we decided to use a subset of the, mic uh, uh, of the microbes that are important or um, dominant within the microbiome. Um, and so spore formers were sort of these cool ones that we, when we colonize the mom with, we saw that it, it prevented deficient um, uh, impairments in thalamocortical axon growth. We saw that it normalized the behavior. Uh, I, did, I guess I didn't even talk about the behavior part. Um, what we saw for the behavior was really interesting. Um, we, we know that the thalamocortical axons are important for conveying sensory behavior. Um, and so we did a whole bunch of different types of sensory behavioral tests, um, but the ones that we saw most perturbed by the absence of a maternal microbiome were these uh, tactile sensory behavior tests. So the first one that we looked at was a von Frey filament test. Um, and uh, when we, the von Frey filament test is used these um, filament, these increasing force filaments to poke at the hind paw of the animal. And typically when you poke with a, uh, a lower force filament, they won't re respond. But as you poke with an increasing force filament, they'll respond by withdrawing their paw. Um, and what we found in this case was that the ABX and germ-free animals required a higher force filament in order to induce a paw withdrawal response. And so this first behavior suggested to us that there was sort of like a, 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 a hyposensitivity in their tactile response or their sensory response. Um, and so we, we were unsure if this was just like a fluke of the behavior test. So, so we did another behavior test that was also testing tactile sensory behavior. And this is the adhesive removal test where we took um, sticky notes and put it onto the forepaw of these mice. And they're just like these little, little, small, teeny tiny um, stickers that we put on their paw. And uh, we put it on their paw and we timed how long it took for 
the animal to notice that there was a sticky note on their paw. And then we timed how long it took for them to remove the sticky note once they noticed that it was there. And so what was interesting is that when we looked at the time for them to notice the sticky note, it took them, the ABX and germ-free animals, a much longer time to notice that there was a sticky note. But once these animals noticed that they had a sticky note on their paw, the ABX and germ-free animals performed the same, uh, performed equally well as the control animals in terms of removing the sticky note. Um, and so this suggested to us that it wasn't a motor deficit, rather it was a sensory um, deficit that these ABX and germ-free animals had um, in, in, in sensing uh, tactile um, stimuli. Um, and uh, this was something that we saw in individual animals and animals if you pull them uh, within a litter. So this was really um, cool to see that it kind of translated across uh, different animals. Um, okay, sorry, I feel like I, I'm jumping back and forth into different parts of the story. Um, but is there any well, questions? I just want to like, and that's really neat because this like the thalamocortical connection that you saw that was disrupted is important for sensory processing. So you Correct. had a kind of a behavioral correlate of the axonogenesis deficit that we have talked about already. And, that, and that's why I was sort of surprised at the specificity because, you know, it's, mm. um, it's, a, it's not a dramatic phenotype. It's, it makes sense based on which axons were deficient, but it's, but you, one would expect that some of these general metabolites would be, uh, you know, important for many kinds of axonal uh, guidance if they're acting as sort of a, more as a permissive factor uh, during development, but but this is almost seems instructive in a way. It's almost like, you know, that they're um, actively actively evolved just to um, affect a specific signaling pathway, which is wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, the other thing that I wanted to mention again was a, a question that was brought up earlier about like window. Um, and part of addressing this window was to look at these behaviors. So just to remind everyone, it's we depleted the maternal microbiome from E0 to E14.5. And we also did the specific spore former colonization from E0 to E14.5. After that E14.5 time period, every mom... Uh, was colonized with the same microbiome. So they're all normalized now. So after E14.5, the spore formers, the, the germ-free ABX, and the, um, the control animals are all um, uh, colonized with the same microbiome using um, controlled bedding. So we just put in these bedding that has the uh, fecal samples from control animals and just put them in normalize everyone. So what was interesting is to be able to see this behavioral effect um, being isolated to just this early window, E0 to E14.5. Right. Um, and so maybe that kind of helps to explain sort of the specificity of why we see just these behavior effects is maybe during this E0 to E14.5 is a really, really critical time for the development of these axons. Um, and if we changed the window to another part of development, maybe we see some other um, developmental consequences and behavioral consequences. Right. Um, yeah, that'd be and, that'd be interesting. It'd be really interesting to know if that if the timing is is why. Because I mean, you're you're right. There's definitely in the brain. There's um, different programs, you know, going on and off in different subregions of the brain. So it's not like every single synapse and every single axon is being made at the same time. And there's a long protracted development even after birth. So, um, so yeah, I guess Elaine's labs, I, I'm assuming you guys are all following up on this. <laughs> yeah. Elaine's lab or my future lab. Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I have, I have a question fun. about the hu the like kind of human implications of this. So um, before pregnancy, you know, like or like I, before women are ready to conceive, they will take a prenatal vitamin and increase their folate levels and prevent birth defects. Is this something that you guys are thinking about? You know, having uh, 
uh, lactobacillus that, you know, you take a, pre- a probiotic that you take um, before you conceive, and that could really help with brain development. Um, is that where you're going? Or do you think that maybe there um, would be a later colonization that would be useful? Um, I know you guys mentioned a paper about malnourished, like children that are malnourished and being rescued with microbiota directed diets in the discussion. Yeah, it would be interesting. Like I said, this is, we have yet to see um, in a more complex microbiome or uh, more physiological disturbance where we're not just depleting the entire microbiome, what kind of effects would we see? So some things that we're interested in is like if we use um, a specific diet like, um, protein restriction or a control diet, how does that shift the microbiome and how does that affect brain development? Something that's a little bit more physiological and and to see if we still see the same dramatic dramatic effects that we see um, for tactile sensory behavior. Um, We are looking at these um, models and not just models about diet, but, you know, like stress models that um, would be something more relevant where um, it's uh, changes in the microbiome, the gut microbiome, the vaginal microbiome, and how that could also impact um, these uh, different neurodevelopmental processes. So it's, it's some directions that we're really, really interested in, in pursuing. I suppose cool. if... Uh... One one thing that would come out of this is that you should avoid antibiotics during pregnancy, right? Yeah, there's. I mean, I you have to take antibiotics if you're having some sort of infection. I mean, I I don't think your doctor would tell you to take antibiotics for no reason. Typically, during pregnancy, the outcomes of not taking antibiotics would be more detrimental than taking antibiotics. So, if you're having some sort of you know, bacterial vaginosis that you would, you would want to um, take the antibiotics to protect yourself and and the developing fetus. Um, But, you know, there are studies out there that um, particularly Marty Blazer's group, where they've looked at how antibiotics can affect the immune system and how that ultimately can lead to these, um, the higher prevalence of allergy, for example, and asthma in, in, in kids. So it's, it's an interesting thought to, um, to see what antibiotics has, the effects of antibiotics has on the development of an animal. Um, but, you know, I'm not saying if you, if you have an infection, don't take antibiotics, yeah, take it. Sure. Uh, talking about antibiotics to make this, uh, these female mice, when they're pregnant, to remove their bacteria, you need to give them antibiotics. How do you distinguish the effect of lack of bacteria from the antibiotics themselves causing some of these effects on the brain? Oh, um, whether you think there's an off-target effect of the the antibiotics? Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So one way that we sort of um, rationalize that is to look at the germ-free animals. So when we look at germ-free animals, they're not exposed to any of the antibiotics. So, and, and in the germ-free, we see, you know, obviously there's caveats to using a germ-free animal, but one thing is to kind of control for the idea of antibiotics, off-target effects of antibiotics. And the germ-free um, offspring have the same um, disturbances and or impairments in the lamocortical axon. So um, we don't think that it's a it's an off-target antibiotic effect. Right. I'm just asking because some antibiotics are known to have developmental effects, right? Like uh, on the teeth development, cartilage and growth. Uh, so. Yeah. In case yeah. These antibiotics have. Yeah. The other the other thought of- before because you're looking at very detailed things in development in the brain, but. But yeah, but it makes sense what you said about the germ-free mice. Yeah. Another option, though I didn't do it in this paper, is we could use um, absorbable versus non-absorbable antibiotics to get at that same question if we, you know, or, just were focusing on antibiotics effects. And you, know. you give the mice uh, antibiotic-resistant bacteria and then give <laughs> antibiotics. And so see if they have. Probably the... I'll- your animal yeah. facility wouldn't like that. So. <laughs> 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 
idea. I guess you show that you can recolonize and correct the deficit, right? Exactly. So with the um, with the uh, antibiotic treated animals, we use you know all, all the groups actually all the groups we put in um, SPF bedding to recolon the animals. So we see that um, we can correct after colonization. And you can, you can correct pre birth, right? But not after birth. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, I should clarify. So the cor it's the correction is the the spore former group, and that we need to see whether or not the effects are limited to a critical window. Um, we colonize everybody after um, after the E fourteen point five time point and and on. But what we did with the um, qPCR of the sixteen S gene is that. We could pretty much um, recolon, uh, yeah, recolonize these animals by sixteen five. So within two days of exposing all the the animals to um, the SPF bedding, two days is sufficient to sort of normalize the microbiota. So it's a pretty quick process. Mm. So, to, to what extent do you think these are these findings are generalizable to people? You know. Mice have these segmented filamentous bacteria. I'm not sure people do. And is it, what do you think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So some of these um, uh, bugs or microbes are not present in, in humans compared to mice. And, and like you said, SFB um, is not in humans, although there might be some. Um, homologous type of bug in the in the in the human intestine um what i probably would consider is not necessarily the the bugs themselves but really the products and how um what the products could be um important for so likely each of these metabolites that we've identified is present in um, the human as well. So if they, whether they have the same effect, I, I don't know. Um, but the, we can say that they are um, at least present in human serum, at least. Yeah. Are there any human neurological deficits that make sense in terms of you know, uh, lack of a microbiome, say? Oh, he, a human deficit that's lack of a microbiome. Um, uh, I don't know about lack of a microbiome. Um, Probably altered would be more accurate. Right? I mean, autism is something that I think is quite interesting. We actually had a, a pilot project that we were doing with, with a collaborator here, June Round, where we were trying to see, I mean, so there's clear microbiome deficit differences in autistic kids, even in the same family, um, although it's not clear if that's genetically based or is it because they have, you know, strange diets. Sometimes they don't like to eat specific kinds of food. But um, but then we were trying to take germ-free mice, which have all these brain defects, and and rescue the the defects by using human poop <laughs> um, to inoculate them. And we were just, and we were trying to see if there's difference differences between autistic kid poop and you know normal poop um but as you say vincent the you know trying to rescue behavior in a mouse with a human microbiome wasn't that straightforward but i, I kind of am intrigued by the correlations because a lot of autistic kids also have gi tract issues and so um yeah. there's something there maybe well, there's the recent paper by um, Sarkis' group, Sarkis Mazmanian's group, where they took, um, I don't know if this is the same study you're referring to, Jason, but they took um, uh, fecal samples from autistic patients and put them into mice, and they were able to recapitulate some of those autism-like behaviors. Um, yeah, that like they beat us to it. I mean, we were trying to do that. <laughs> uh, we didn't really see as robust effects as they did, but, you know, <laughs> we well, didn't. If I, 
I don't think that their effects were super robust either. Yeah. If I remember, cor- if I remember the paper, yeah, yeah, it's a complicated. Well, they to do. they published yeah. it. It's <laughs> yeah, out there. Yeah, I think I think the transplants. There's probably you know certain caveats of how many human samples are you transplanting into an, yeah, an animal yeah. and how how it actually recapitulates the human effects. Um, we, you know, every that's a consideration to take into right. account. All right, I have to wrap this up, folks. That's um, twin number fifteen. You can find it at microbe.tv slash twin, T-W-I-N. If you want to send us questions and comments, twin at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. Go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. Our guest today from the University of California, Los Angeles, Helen Vuong. Thank you, Helen, for joining us. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Nice talking to everyone. Ori Lieberman's Ori Lieberman on Twitter. Thanks, Ori. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks, Helen. Andres Bendesky is at Bendesky on Twitter. Thanks, Andres. Thanks, Vincent, and thanks, Helen, for joining us. And Jason Shepard's Jason Synaptic on the Twitter. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Vincent. Yeah, thanks, Helen, and say say hi to Lane for me. I will. I'll let her know. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.com. WS. You've been listening to This Week in Neuroscience. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon.